Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm a retired accountant, and I'm not, I'm not going to be like Clarence Darrow, uh, so I hope I don't disappoint too much. But I, uh, as a father of two uh, sons, I just felt like I ought to come down here and uh, say a few words on, the, on this issue. High schools and colleges should ban military recruiters from campuses. This is really two different questions. High schools have underage minors, teenagers. So let's talk about high schools first. From childhood, we grow by stages to greater degrees of capability and judgment. In this society, we have a thing called the age of consent, whether it's for sex or for marriage. We have an age of majority for being bound by our contracts. You can argue about this uh, age, but not the principle. <clears throat> There's no real question that underage minors are going to be protected uh, by parents and by society. Some teenagers are more mature than others. But laws have to be based on objective tests, and so the law for contracts, for example, is age 18. Uh, for this reason, military recruiters have no business talking with underage minors in the public schools, since they can't enlist anyway. The age for enlistment is 18, uh, or 17 if your parents make the decision for you, which just uh, reemphasizes the, uh, the existence of this rule. So the real character of most recruiters' activities in high schools is ideological. It's marketing, and it's grooming uh, teenagers who are under 18 towards the day when they're old enough to join the military. Unfortunately, uh, recruiters are not certified to teach in schools, and uh, the things they're saying are not uh, qualified as curriculum. Uh, they, uh, the whole question is really laughable anyway, since they have a conflict of interest. Their purpose is to get recruits, not to educate young people. So long story short, the uh, K-12 public schools are for education. They have no obligation for the national defense, certainly for raising armies, and, uh, and uh, they're for underage minors, and that's that. Uh, so let's move on to the reasons why both universities and high schools should ban military recruiters. They're untruthful propositions to young people and the large-scale illegal activities of the military. I don't want to keep you in suspense on the latter. I'm referring to Article 6 of the Constitution that makes treaties of the United States binding as supreme law of the land. The UN Charter is a treaty that prohibits war other than self-defense, and the US military knows this, but they're obeying illegal orders. Furthermore, any declaration of war by a president is also defective. War powers reside in the Congress under Article I of the Constitution and cannot be delegated to the President without amending the Constitution. I'm also referring to the Accountability Clause of the Constitution, uh, which requires the Pentagon and other government agencies to make an accounting for its expenditures. Defense expenditures have been unauditable since at least 1990, and unauth unauthorized transactions exceed a trillion dollars every year. Uh, the audits of the DOD accounting were discontinued in 2001. Recruiters also solicit recruits to do actions that are illegal under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits unequal treatment on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Recruiters violate the civil rights of gay persons by refusing them enlistment, and the military does likewise. So in summary, the scale of these illegal behaviors merits formal prohibition by uh, universities um, and high schools. Universities should not collaborate with any agency, public or private, that uh, is engaging in illegal acts. So let's move on to questions of recruiters' untruthfulness and methods. Regardless of the university's position regarding illegal wars, it should protect its own students and its own good name from uh, deceptive or unethical recruiting practices. Recruiters frequently omit information and misrepresent the true facts about war and military service to a, materi a material degree. That is, many recruits would not join the military if they had known the truth. So this is an issue of basic fairness, about informed consent. To begin with, the enlistment contract is uh, unconscionable. It allows the military to change the terms at any time. So this makes it impossible to uh, you know, have basic fairness or for the recruits to know what they're getting into. In business, that would be, uh, uh, that would be uh, an unenforceable contract. We've had statutes of frauds uh, for centuries that protects the parties to contracts. Um, and since the 1930s, we've furthermore had securities laws. I worked as a CPA for 20 years. And CPAs in the SEC protect the wealthy investors from omissions and misrepresentations in a very granular way. This can be done. Uh, recruiters uh, also use unethical methods, but I'm going to leave those until last if I have time. The, uh, let's go into the untruths here specifically. They, they appeal to multiple levels of the teenager's brain. They appeal to emotion and to intellect. 
but they're trained and guided by research and psychological studies provided by universities and think tanks and uh, the advertising industry under multi-million dollar contracts. Now this is the root of all the untruths, is that the presentations are not primarily intended to inform the recruit about the military or about war, but rather to understand the teenager's brain and understand their propensities to enlist and how to, uh, how to make the military resemble those things. <laughs> so for example, they talk about career and education, even though those are incidental to the real transaction. So there are three sizes of untruths. They're kind of like t-shirts, small, medium, and large. The small ones are straightforward untrue statements and abuses and deliberate lies, which are uh, around 500 cases per year uh, are in the public record or reported on TV. Uh, this varies from year to year. You know, uh, even the military wants to correct these abuses, and uh, basically this isn't going to remedy the problem of untruths if we correct all the little uh, concrete untruths. And so uh, I'm not very concerned about those. I think uh, the uh, military is primarily concerned about protecting the military from recruiters who bring in people who don't have a high school diploma or who have a, a criminal history and so forth. The medium untruths are the whole proposition that the military is a smart way to uh, get a better career or to get a better education. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to start with the large untruths. And these are false ideologies. These ideologies are not accepted by most of the cultures on Earth or most of the, uh, the spiritual authorities or philosophers or by parents, even by conservatives. Number one is uh, that the nation is your supreme unit of affiliation, the federal government. This is above yourself or your family, above your community, uh, or above the human race. D does anybody really believe that? I don't think so. Uh, another example is that the inhabitants of other nations are different from our nation, and their well-being matters less than Americans. 96% of humanity lives outside the United States. Um, another example is that surrendering unconditional obedience to a supreme leader is a virtue, an honorable thing. Another is that all contests are ultimately resolved by physical power, and this is the freedom isn't free myth. Under this myth, all diplomacy, business contracts, or social relationships, or freedoms exist only at the pleasure of the world's militaries. Actually, most uh, problems and uh, allocations in the world are allocated by agreement. Um, recruiters also continue to state incorrectly that the nation is at war and under attack by other nations. Recruiters also demonize the peoples of foreign countries targeted for invasion by the President and Congress. Teenagers might change their ideological beliefs and their enlistment decisions quite drastically if the following material facts were not omitted. So I just talked about misrepresentations and now I'm talking about omissions. Recruiters omit an accurate picture of the hazing and dehumanization of boot camp, which disproves the recruiter's presentation of honor, dignity, and respect. They omit an accurate representation of war and combat, the actual experience of the uh, fighters and the victims and the civilians. They omit an accurate history of past U.S. wars, their underlying causes in political economy, and the precipitating events that started them, which were often lies referring to the sinking of the Maine, the Gulf of Tonkin, weapons of mass destruction, and so forth. These were untruthfully characterized as attacks on the United States or imminent threats. Uh, Medium-sized untruths include uh, the education and career are the main pitches. Of course, these are purely incidental to serving in war, and so they're uh, a distraction from the real transaction. Enlistment is actually not necessarily a good way to further your education. This is like selling you oxygen. Anybody who can qualify for college or university has access to financial aid, including guaranteed loans. Billions of dollars have gone unclaimed in recent years. Up to a third of the veterans don't qualify for the full level of the GI Bill anyway. You have to serve your full term. You have to obtain a uh, honorable discharge and a number of other conditions. You have to pay $1,200 contribution. And you lose the contribution if you don't uh, get the uh, benefits. Only 15% of veterans end up getting a four-year college degree anyway, compared with 30% of high school graduates as a whole. The GI Bill anyways reduces other financial aid. Another proposition is that enlistment is a good way to advance your career, and <clears throat> that you're going to learn career skills. The VA's own studies reveal that specialties learned in the military 
are used only by 12% of males and 6% of females. Uh, th like most of these other questions, any one of these questions is an adversarial question that would take more than 10 minutes in itself, and so uh, I'm just going to be moving fast here. The military schools for electronics, which I attend, I was in electronics school, and other technologies are really operator schools to, to operate the equipment. Everything is sealed in black box components, and if you want to learn engineering, you go to college and you go to work for Boeing or Raytheon or one of the defense contractors. Uh, so I'm going to move on to, to the smaller untruths. The most widespread falsification by recruiters are um, some of the qualifications required for enlistment, such as uh, whether or not a person has a diploma or drug test. In other words, you have recruiters collaborating with recruits uh, to, you know, to fill in the form to get in. Uh, those are uh, offenses that the military pursues fairly rigorously. But the other falsifications, which are at the expense of the recruit, are not so often uh, protected. Um, these include uh, the exposure to stop loss orders. In other words, the military can extend your uh, term. Um, uh, you, for example, Emilio Santiago here in Seattle lost his case. He had enlisted at age 18, served his term, and then wanted to get out, but they extended his enlistment. He lost his case. He's extended to the year 2032. You waive your civil rights. You go into a completely different legal system called the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, recruiters uh, omit to mention the prevalence of hazing, racism, or sexual abuse in the military. Sexual abuse is rampant. 60% of women and 27% of men in the military reserves and National Guard suffer uh, sexual assault or harassment during their service. Uh, racism and uh, other uh, abuses are also frequent. Uh, for obvious reasons, recruiters don't tell teenagers their right to be a conscientious objector even after they've enlisted or to cancel their delayed entry uh, contract. Delayed enlistment, most uh, recruits sign a delayed entry program for some period of time. They're not in the military and then the day comes for them to go and take the pledge. That's when you enter the military. So uh, I'm just going to wrap it up here. Uh, high schools and colleges have no responsibility for the national defense. They're a larger sector of the U.S. economy and uh, the U.S. culture than the military, and uh, they can and should ban recruiters for both ethical and legal reasons. The ethical problem is that they omit and misrepresent war and military service so materially that the recruits would not enlist if they knew the truth. The additional ethical problem regarding high schools is that the uh, students are underage minors. They're entitled to be uh, protected from society until they're older. And the legal problem is that the military is engaged in gravely illegal and unconstitu un unconstitutional activities. Thank you very much. Okay, well, if I uh, sound a little nervous as I get started here, it's uh, because I am nervous. This is a big group and uh, at a very uh, very intimidating array of uh, seats and faces. I uh, also have the added uh, uh, difficulty of having my wife Charlene in the, in the audience, which means that I can't go home tonight and declare this as a roaring success and how well I did. So. I am a longtime uh, Seattle resident. Uh, as Leah mentioned in the introduction, I'm also have been in the active duty Army for 12 years and the remainder of my time in the Army Reserve. Uh, I've lived here in the, inside the Seattle city limits. And that means that my three sons are the product of Seattle public schools. And so I've had a first-hand opportunity to watch the unique American educational experience take place. And I don't think any one of my three boys thought that the American educational experience was unique because Charlene and I both lived through it. Most of you lived through it. But we've also had the opportunity to have foreign students in our home, about seven or eight of them, with backgrounds as diverse as from Turkmenistan to Taiwan. And there's a huge difference in those educational systems. They are great encyclopedias. They are subjugated to strict testing requirements. And if you don't test out in grade school, you don't get selected to the next school that's prestigious enough 
to ensure that you go to the right university, which ensures that you are qualified for a certain level of job. The founders of our country were coming from Europe, and they envisioned a situation where the population of this country would make determination as to who would rule them, who would lead them. They quickly realized that for that to happen, they could not duplicate the European model. Ignorant masses that existed only to be ruled by the elite. They had to be ignorant so that the elite could tell them what the right course of action was. So they envisioned a population of people who would be exposed to education. Education not only to ensure that they were literate, so they could read newspapers, read political handbills, and make discriminatory decisions, but an educational experience that taught them to question, taught them the skills of critical thinking. And I would submit to you that in large part, the success in the last 200 years of this nation is based upon the wisdom of that educational model, producing people who may not be able to spout every quadratic formula by rote memory, as the student from Taiwan could, or may not be able to explain every engineering uh, situation in precise terms, but has the innate ability to understand the problem and fashion reasonable courses of actions to overcome the difficulty. Somewhere, and I'm going to say in the 50s, but I'm not, I have not done any research and I'm not read any research. Somewhere along the line, in the 50s, the academic community, through what I would suggest is isolationism, became somewhat of an elitist organization. And slowly, the open discussion of competing ideas in the educational system fell out of vogue. Students who tried to bring up or who sincerely asked a question out of interest or possibly ignorance were not encouraged, and the open discussion of that question was not encouraged. Rather, the student's competing idea was minimalized, ridiculed, curtailed, with the eventual requirement that it be silenced. Today's topic is just that simple. Today's topic is whether a valid, official representation of a job career, job opportunity, can be made known to students as a competing idea in the free marketplace of ideas, or whether the academic elite should censor that free expression and prevent free thinking people from making their own decision. Todd's talked a little bit about 18 year olds. We know from experience and from academic research, some of which has been conducted right here at the University of Washington, that the male brain is not considered fully matured until age 26. Should we restrict male right to vote? We grant that ability to you at 18 years old. Should we restrict your ability to drive? You don't have a fully mature brain. No, because experience and our background and our society says that yes, young children, 10, 11, and 12, should not be held to the same standards as adults. But as young adults mature, 16, 17, they can be held to a higher standard. And by 18, they can exercise their free will, their ability to think critically and make rational decisions as to who will govern them. So again, I think this is a relatively simple issue. The decision does not really depend, as you think about it, on whether you believe President Bush lied about weapons of mass destruction. 
It doesn't hinge on whether your conviction is that it is never right for a human being to take another human being's life. It has nothing to do about better ways to settle international disputes. And it certainly has nothing to do with accounting irregularities at the Department of Defense, whatever they may be. It has everything to do with whether one group should exercise censorship to prevent a competing idea from being exposed to another group.